Mm. You okay, Sana? Yeah, something like that. No one said it outright, but they're really useful. But you'll be one of them. But I play terribly and still enjoy myself. Okay, welcome everybody to uh, the fourth of six uh, meetings of the Ottawa Historical Association this year. Uh, for those of you, I'm Dominique Marshall. I help coordinate this together with all sorts of good people in the room who are here today. Um, we have two more after this, and the list of all of them is on the counter. When you get out, please feel free to take one. And uh, by all means, there's enough for everyone. Take one or two of these one. This is the poster for the next one, which is on February the 11th, same time, same place. And Constance Crompton, who teaches communication at the University of Ottawa, will come to talk about recent challenges and promises of digital history and the gay liberation movement. So we wanted to do something about digital history. We wanted to do something about the history of gender and sexuality. And there she was fitting the bill for both. Uh, and so put it on your door, uh, circulate it. And also Daniela Debac, who is in charge of communications, sends a poster digitally on the uh, Facebook and, uh, and Twitter page. And so you could also use that for publicity. Uh, it is uh, also, we look quite technical tonight because uh, I think it's our first uh, when the CBC IDs in Toronto saw the uh, announcement of this lecture. Um, one enlightened person thought that together with Adrian Simpson's show at the Art Gallery of Ontario that could make for a nice program. So Selma here is taping the audio of this and some of it will probably make it in the program, so it's a, it's a great treat to have this. And I am videotaping that section, but when Adrian stops talking after 40 minutes or so, and we have an, half an hour for the, of discussion, then I switch it off. So you won't be on radio, you won't be on video, even if you would like well, to. Well, everybody deserves a camera. <laughs> so, okay, next, next thing I need to do, there is some water at the back uh, in a kind of big picture, and there are some glasses if you want to have that, and the washrooms are over there. And we will start by a few minutes with uh, Jim McKillop, who is a historian at uh, the Department of National Defense in charge of the many volume history of Canada in Afghanistan, the Canadian Army in Afghanistan, and they're finishing volume one. He's going to introduce Adrian and also give us a little uh, context. And all that would not have been possible without John McFarlane, who was part of the group who's been organizing these every year, and John is uh, uh, in charge of the whole program that uh, Adrian will discuss. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, hi, I'm Jim McKillop. Uh, you notice my name is significantly absent from the picture here. Um, that's not an accident. Uh, I don't have a lot to say here at the beginning. Uh, I am working with the Department of National Defense. I write official history. The project I'm working on is the uh, Canadian Forces operations in Southwest Asia. We're finishing up the first uh, year uh, story, which is the first volume. That should be done fairly soon. So my main function here tonight is to provide a context that Adrian might want, and I can speak to the decade and a half experience in Afghanistan, uh, mostly for the questions if somebody has something. But if some, something comes up during the presentation, I can certainly address that as well. Um, I was in Afghanistan myself right at the very beginning. I was in the Army for about 32 years, and then I retired into a happy life of being an official historian. Uh, so uh, really, I'm here for context and to answer any questions, OK? Now, Adrian, uh, we, we go back a long way. <laughs> and we met at 11.45 this morning. <laughs> but we had a good it long feels like a lifetime. <laughs> 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 uh, we had a good, good. long chat. Um, there's a, it's a very interesting the degree to which there's crossover and experiences that I've seen and recognized and uh, have started chronicling and things that he experienced. I was there for a relatively long time. He was there for a short time. I was there in an operational role. He was there in this very specific Canadian Forces Artist Program role. Uh, but it's fascinating to see the degree to which there is this, you know, these layers of connection. And uh, maybe we can get to a little bit of that as we go along. So without wasting any more of your time, we'll get to the main act here. Adrian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
ook in ons zoveel. De studie daar ik ook voor is gemaakt die ik ze voor wou dan. Die doet doet six a ga, six a ga. In my language, which is Blackfoot, I always uh, say uh, hello, all my relations. I give my name, my Blackfoot name is uh, Little Brown Boy Heavy Shield. And uh, I'm from Siksika, the Blackfoot Nation in southern Alberta. And it's good to be here with you all tonight. And I uh, want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to uh, be here tonight and uh, share this time uh, with, uh, with me and with all of us. So thank you for that. And uh, also thank you uh, to the Ottawa Historical Association, Dominique, uh, for uh, organizing and making all this happen. And the Canadian Forces Artist Program, uh, John, thank you so much. It's been nice to get to know you over the years and uh, very uh, happy to be a, a part of this program. And, um, and the Ottawa Art Gallery uh, for hosting this tonight. Thank you, everyone. And uh, James, uh, Dr. McKillop, thank you so much. It's been really uh, nice to uh, spend this morning with you and, and chat and stuff. So thank you for that. And thank you for being here to, uh, to uh, take part in this. Uh, what I'm going to do, I have about, uh, well, I guess I should put a timer on because sometimes I get carried away. Uh, about 40 minutes. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just give you a bit of context at first, uh, myself as an artist and some of the work that I've, I've done previously, uh, and then a bit of familial history as to, you know, why is it that I am interested uh, in the Canadian Forces or in the military as such, and then uh, images from the time I spent uh, in Afghanistan, uh, intermixed with some of the work that I created. Uh, it was interesting, as I created this uh, uh, new slideshow, uh, I always usually left my work till the very end, but then for some reason I thought, oh, maybe I'll let you disperse it. It might be a little different. So tonight be a little different for me in terms of uh, presentations. You know, when you uh, give presentations over a number of years, you get a little tired of hearing yourself drone on. Uh, so uh, I thought I'd change it up a bit and it's a little bit different. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to start, as I mentioned, I'm from the Siksika Blackfoot Nation in southern Alberta. Um, a lot of my work, I did my uh, undergraduate, undergraduate at the Alberta College of Art and Design, now the Univers U Alberta Art oh. University, oh, I can't even say it, Alberta University of the Arts. And then I went on to uh, the University of Saskatchewan and Saskatoon to do my master's. And it was from there that I, I went on and continued uh, my work and then heard about the program and then in two, uh, 2010 uh, took part in it. So for me, I was trying to sort of summer, give a bit of a summary of my work. I'm, I started off as a painter uh, and then I moved into performance and installation and now I call myself interdisciplinary because I kind of do it all from sculpture to painting to this and that, which actually in my mind is the reality that uh, artists face these days is that in terms of being wanting to have a full-time career as an artist, you got to mix it up a bit. So for me, that's sort of where I place myself now. But a lot of my work really looks at the history of, uh, of uh, my people, the Blackfoot on the plains, and it really begins sort of more, more recently with the uh, slaughter uh, of the bison. And uh, my people were very closely aligned with the bison, uh, all our societies are a lot of related to the bison. We are a matriarchal society, and uh, the Moto Geeks, which is the Buffalo Women's Society, is our lead, uh, lead society. And uh, they basically sort of direct us in, in many different ways. So as you can imagine, with the loss of the bison, um, it, uh, it uh, threw our way of life, way of life um, quite drastically, or changed our way of life quite drastically. So part of that is that I started, I started doing work around the bison and looking at it. But I was also studying physics at the time and, and I'm looking at this idea that we're all just atoms and we're all just these containers for these atoms. And we're not so different from this table or anything else, which really aligns wonderfully with indigenous knowledge and indigenous ideas about that everything uh, is living, and which in fact it is. But for me, I start to look at it, this idea that uh, all that energy at the time of the slaughter of the bison was released into the universe. And I believe that that energy still exists in and around us. So I have the privilege as an artist to, to sort, of, sort of reach into that ether, get that energy, bring it into myself, and then create work from that. And then hopefully, if my dealer's doing a good job, <laughs> I make money from that. So in essence, the bison is still providing me with a living today, no different from my ancestors. So I take solace in that. And when I think about that, that's sort of one of the things that sort of carries me through as I, I think about that sort of traumatic history. 
So I've done a lot of work over the years in terms of that history. Uh, and then I started taking bison and putting them sort of in imagined landscapes, uh, sort of in, uh, in this early work, uh, inserting things like a uh, nuclear explosion, uh, these kind of things, just to sort of start um, creating layers. I often think of my work almost like an archaeological dig. As you move through it, you start to see different meanings and contexts of what I'm doing in my work. Uh, drawing, of course, with, uh, with the bison again. Um, uh, more paintings. These ones are all starting to be about uh, landscape and industry. Uh, pipelines in particular, uh, pump jacks on the plains, uh, agriculture. All these things that <coughs> have changed the, the face of the prairies over the years and, uh, and uh, you know, changed our way of life and our relationship too, uh, to the bison and, and the plains. Uh, so for me, it was interesting as I was looking at these, I think, well, how does my work in general relate to the topic of war, and uh, in, in particular Afghanistan? And I have to say that actually a lot of my work deals with ideas of historical conflict, trauma, uh, I'm also a uh, residential day school uh, thrive, thriver. I now say thriver instead of survivor, uh, because I'm, I, I, in spite of that, uh, I live my life fully today. Um, so I was really thinking about that, and, and so I think a lot of my work does relate as we move through, and hopefully you'll see the connections as, we, as I show you the images. Uh, bones with the fine line um, uh, moving through, crossing that line, um, and such. More recently, at the uh, Toronto Biennale, my work with A.A. Bronson, uh, which deals with reconciliation. I, I think, you know, when we, when we talk about historical trauma and conflict, uh, how do we move through to, to a better place? And certainly, reconciliation is a space, or I like to call conciliation, uh, if you haven't done it before. And I think it's something that, uh, that uh, I work, uh, that I, I work in, the area that I work in. So again, the bison often shows up in my work. And then recently at the New Calgary Public Library, I uh, had an installation. I've been also looking at pictographic uh, history of the Blackfoot and uh, how each one of these little symbols contains a whole story. And uh, this one was called uh, Calgary and Alberta, Past, Present, Future Count. So it's based on our winter counts. And the reason uh, that I put this in here is because our counts uh, often ended up on bison robes or on, um, uh, on uh, stone edifices and such. And, uh, and a lot of the times it was usually the warriors who uh, often recounted uh, their exploits on these bison robes. Um, and these are three large sculptures that go along with that that move in more into the 3D, uh, the eagle and the seven generations, the universal teepee, and uh, uh, bison man. <laughs> so, again, for the Calgary Library in context. Uh, on my reserve, uh, there were two residential schools, Old Sun Residential School uh, in the west, which was run by the Anglicans, and Crowfoot School in the east, which was run by uh, the Catholics. So a lot of my work deals also with that historical trauma as well, as my family, my father and, and aunties and, and going back, all attended those schools, and so a lot of my work speaks to that. And one of the tools, or strategies, that I use as an artist is humor. Uh, humor, uh, depending on the situation, can be taken many different ways. But I often find that uh, humor opens things up, and you can start exploring ideas. And this one is a historical image from the first um, uh, Anglican mission on the, on the nation. And the priest on the far side, away from me in the corner, is the Reverend Timms, who is actually A. a. Bronson's great-great-grandfather. And that's why our connection together in terms of the idea of him looking at his own uh, familial history and how we, how can we reconcile those histories. And I have another character, uh, a performance persona, Buffalo Boy. So I'd often juxtapose these historical images with uh, created images and sort of look at this history. And uh, Buffalo Boy is uh, a uh, performance persona that I embody at different times. He's dreaming right now and uh, basically is a fusion of Buffalo Bill, uh, also of uh, the sort of the quotation Indian cowboy, and uh, two-spirited being. So it's this fusion of all those different ideas. So Buffalo Boy is, uh, the life and times have been uh, pretty, pretty full. 
Uh, this is another image from the first mission, the Anglican Boys Choir, and again, Buffalo Boy doing his thing to comment on that history. And those are often juxtaposed together in the exhibitions. But I also do work that, you know, that looks at those, at that, that historical trauma, and this one's called Sick and Tire, Tired. Uh, it's an old uh, residential school bed with the uh, form of uh, uh, a body uh, that's actually a bison robe. And three of the original windows, these are actually all original items from the uh, Olson Residential School, uh, filled with feathers and backlit. And uh, often thinking about the idea that the children in those schools would look out those win windows and that sense of being smothered within those spaces. Uh, Beyond Redemption is an installation uh, that looked at the historical slaughter of the bison and the idea of interrogating that history. Buffalo Boy again, in a more sort of stance that, uh, <laughs> and that's when he had really nice legs. <laughs> Should have insured them then, could have got something. <laughs> and then of course the, the mm. playing, it's sort of, uh, it, ideas of camp and play are often in there, and I thought I'd include this one, Buffalo Boy getting it from four directions, uh, perhaps a military sort of relation in a sense that sometimes, or uh, a lot of times indigenous people feel like they are getting it from all directions. <laughs> And Buffalo Boy can ride a horse. And then Buffalo Boy begat the uh, Shaman Exterminator, who's a little bit more of an ominous character, and uh, someone who sort of looks at issues around Pan-Indianism, uh, shamanism in itself, who's not a shaman himself, but all those, those issues that sort of, play, or sort of um, investigate uh, those, those histories. And then, of course, um, uh, um, uh, performances, and this is with Laurie Blondeau, and actually, that's Rebecca Belmore under the, <laughs> under the uh, helmet there. Uh, and we did a whole series called Putting the Wild Back into the West. Uh, and identity, and this is one of the things that uh, plays a lot in my work, uh, the construction of indigeneity, uh, how Hollywood sort of created this idea of the Indian and how that's mostly based on Plains tribes and, uh, and how that history sort of plays out even today. And this was an image from Barcelona, Spain, uh, as I turned the corner, a little shop that was full of indigenous uh, uh, paraphernalia and, and dream catchers and many postcards of my own relatives, like Bull Bear and stuff like that. I should have asked them if I would be getting royalties. But in the back, there's um, uh, Sitting Bull and then the sort of infamous cigar store Indian and then the real Indian. <laughs> and of course, at the end of Las Ramblas is Christopher Columbus himself. Uh, who is often credited with uh, finding North America. And what a great opportunity to uh, have a performance there. So I did a little mini one called Pointing Back at Columbus. <laughs> so I just have a bit of a summary of my work in general. And, uh, and I'm, again, very, very lucky to be a full-time artist and being able to sort of pursue my ideas and, and work with so many wonderful people uh, through time. Um, for me, my familial history, um, my uh, grandmother was a war bride, uh, so I have family in the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, my mother met my father in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and he's from uh, Sixaga, the Blackfoot Reserve. But um, my great-grandfather, -grand Captain Eric Dean, who served in the Royal Flying uh, uh, Corps in the First World War, and also ended up in Her Majesty's Secret Service in the Second World War and receiving a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. And that's a whole other story that I'm researching right now because uh, uh, it, my aunt, who's a great uh, researcher, uh, dug up that stuff because we didn't know until the 80s that it was actually in the Secret Service. So that's something that I found quite interesting. Uh, my uh, great-grandfather, Private uh, Francis Garrett from Canada here, served in, sec in, in, in both the First and Second World Wars. Uh, both my grandparents, Sergeant Major Alan Garrett and Private Joan Dean. She was a wireless operator during uh, the Second World War. And my father, oh sorry, I'm not playing, catching up here, so that's my great-grandfather. That's my uh, grandmother. That's her crew that she was with. And then uh, my father, Second Lieutenant Adrian Stimson, served in the Canadian Reserves uh, Cadet Services. And that is an image from the Gordon First Nation uh, in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, where we're at that time in the uh, 70s. Uh, there he is again. And then my father always uh, found interesting because he, wherever he went, he would make friends with people, and he ended up in a, an American, uh, one of their Air Force 
big jets when he was on a trip in the south. And so this was from, from that. It was amazing how he could get into these places. But then I look at the history of the Blackfoot, and I come from a history of uh, uh, warrior societies. And uh, they, uh, and there's great tradition in that, uh, the brave dog or the crazy dogs and, and such. Uh, so I come from that history as well. But also through time, uh, in the uh, 50s, we also had our cadet corps. And these are some of the images uh, from, uh, from then. So even on my nation, there was a relation to the Canadian military uh, throughout time as was for many indigenous people. And the old sun cadets. And then here is, I just wanted to, in terms of a citation, uh, this one by L. James Dempsey uh, looks at, the, uh, by, uh, uh, at all the various depictions of warrior exports on bison robes or on writing on stone, etc. So this in particular one was from uh, writing on stone, uh, um, showing the uh, Pagans, which are one of our tribes, uh, uh, fighting the, the gross uh, ventures in uh, 1867. And then this one is, uh, was an etching done by Paul Kane, or not etching, a uh, drawing done by uh, Paul Kane uh, when he was traveling to the Paris in 1848. And uh, it was of the, uh, uh, about the piece owned by Sinew, is his name. And then from the uh, First World War, did we? Correct, yeah. Uh, Michael Mountain Horse uh, was a Blackfoot warrior who took part in that particular battle. And when he came home, he did his own depiction of his time uh, in those battles. And he did his, uh, his uh, robe at that time. And most recently, I did a performance related around uh, Michael and the 100th anniversary of, uh, of the battle at uh, Vimy Ridge. I myself was a naval seaman in the, uh, in the, uh, during the uh, Katimovic option program back in the, uh, in the 80s. So I have uh, my time in the military as well, and that was our group then. And then, more recently, uh, from, uh, from Af Afghanistan, with the Canadian Forces Artist Program, I'm also going to just sort of intersperse uh, this talk with um, some of my writing. I, could, I basically journaled my entire trip uh, to Afghanistan. So these are just excerpt, excerpts from that uh, journal that was published in uh, Black Flash magazine. And uh, so that, uh, that was the, uh, the um, publication where, uh, where actually my, a lot of my work started to get uh, recognized. So this was in 2010, March the 2nd. I chatted with Myrna the other day. She began to cry and told me she was scared. I told her everything would be all right. There's been a lot of emotion around this trip. My own mind wanders between fear and confidence. March 15th, possible name of the next exhibition, holding our breath. I completed my will and power of attorney today Seeing people, I'm amazed and honored by the outpouring of love, so many concerned and wishing me well. This is amazing. I bring all my loved ones with me. I chatted with my Uncle Jim today, and I'm feeling the need to connect with family and friends. I traveled from Banff to Siksika and hung out with Dad, Mom, Happy, Myrna, Letty, Arlene, Jason, and Pam. Came in for dinner. Dad gave a most amazing toast to my trip, raw yet beautiful, a way my father can be emotional, deep breaths, everyone hanging on, mother leaves the room, outpouring of love, harm's way, supportive, come home safe. Ma Pam hands out tissues, dad cut my hair earlier in the day, a bit of a buzz cut, love it. <laughs> so when we, uh, uh, so when I uh, first heard about it, uh, th the program and applied and was accepted, uh, we were waiting, of course, for a, a deployment, and I had uh, uh, requested Afghanistan in, in specific. But at the time, too, the, uh, ha uh, the earthquake in uh, Haiti happened, and so they also offered me that, and they could get me there right away. But I decided in the end, because I also realized it was the end, coming to the end of the mission, that it was something that I wanted to, to, to experience and, and be a part of and, and comment on. And uh, so I, when I found out I was going to Afghanistan, it all happened very quickly. And, uh, and then, uh, and of course, I was off. 
And then, uh, as James mentioned, and I heard often, uh, the worst kept secret <laughs> was the forward, or the, um, uh, the, what is it called, the um, operational base, or where things come out of, and it was just outside of Dubai, United Arab Emirates. So I had the opportunity to fly commercially to Dubai, and then go to Camp Mirage, and then hung out there for a bit, and debriefed, and, or briefed, and then, uh, and then made my way over to Afghanistan. So the old, or the new and the old uh, Dubai, which is actually a pretty amazing city. I included a couple maps in here to sort of give you a bit of uh, idea of, of where uh, I was uh, sent. Uh, well, of course, Kandahar, bottom there, and then Kandahar, and then Masangar is right by Panjwa, which is the little town close to there. And it's also a uh, province, isn't it, as well? It's a region. region. Kandahar yeah. province. Yeah. And so you can see the, the, the sort of the distance between those two places. Um, and uh, <coughs> yes, and uh, uh, sort of a, a desert and, and such. Um, so on my way from uh, Camp Mirage, uh, we took a Hercules uh, air aircraft uh, to uh, Kandahar, and that's the uh, Kandahar airport. Uh, it was quite uh, interesting, uh, having not flown in Hercules before. Uh, I was when I first got I got into it, it kind of reminded me of uh, I don't know if anybody watches Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> the, the inside of the big spaceships, which is all just basically looking mechanical. <laughs> it's not your luxury uh, airliner per se, and uh, so for me it was like ooh. But then I thought. Actually, this is kind of good because if anything goes wrong, you can actually fix it while you're flying. <laughs> and so I thought that that was pretty, pretty interesting. But uh, all the troops were being uh, deployed uh, to uh, Kandahar. They all piled in, and it was. A, I have to say, a lot of it was kind of a surreal experience in the sense that it really did give me a very uh, sort of intimate and first-hand look. And so we were all sort of just sort of piled in there. I can't even remember if there were seat belts. I don't think there were. But you know, and as you're flying, and then you're all sort of piled in there, and everybody has their guns, and <laughs> it's kind of like this, and a pile of humanity in this sort of little space, and, and very intimate, and, and uh, it was something that, uh, that, that I remember quite, uh, quite well, and, and uh, found it to be, uh, there was a, how, how do I say it, sort of like a, there was a tenderness in it, if I could say that, in sort of this camar camaraderie, and this sort of everyone knowing that they're going off together. And uh, for me, that was a, a, a special moment. And then, of course, Kandahar. And actually, uh, just to sort of digress a little bit, when we got to, the, when we left the Kandahar airport, it actually had like a screening sort of, um, like, you know, at every airport where you, you, know, you have to go through the metal detector. But it was really kind of funny because, of course, everybody dropped off their guns, went through the metal detector, and then picked up their guns on the other side. <laughs> so I thought, okay, <laughs> that's kind of interesting. <laughs> I have it in the first place. <laughs> so again, okay, then I just started taking images. I think for me, my intent in uh, joining the program was just to observe the daily lives of the soldiers and just to really get an understanding and a feel and record that and record uh, the landscape and uh, the bases themselves, Kandahar and the, Kandahar and the uh, forward operating base, uh, Massimbar. And the uh, airfield at Kandahar is massive. And while I was there, it was, there was just so many um, uh, transport planes bringing in American troops. Uh, the International Security Assistance Force, uh, with all the different um, uh, countries represented at Kandahar, and, and all of them coming in. So you get all these different uh, transports coming in and soldiers just pouring into the base, uh, which was also very, very interesting. I was very, I was actually have to say that, you know, I thought of my, my, my sort of um, mobility around the uh, Kandahar and Massagor would be really restricted, but it was one of the things that I found very uh, wonderful is that basically they gave me access to almost everything, and it's one thing that I found very interesting, and for the first few years, a number of my images, of course, I couldn't release uh, because of time and sensitivity, so uh, a lot of these images actually you're all seeing for the first time, so that's interesting. Uh, the American forces. Um, uh, base there, I, I thought this was an interesting in, the image. Kandahar, well as I mentioned, we're in the desert. Uh, very dry, very dusty. Uh, Kandahar, because it, it's a big base, had its own sewer treatment. So there's always this wafting sort of 
odor in the air. But it's interesting because I'm also a, uh, a, a happy to participate at Burning Man. 